Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the Syracuse University Library session. I'm joined by a number of colleagues from the admissions office behind the scenes, as well as, as, well as my colleague Abby from the SU Library, and we're here to uh, share some helpful information for you this evening. I will also direct your attention to the Q&A box, the question and answer box. If you have questions or need clarification on anything during tonight's session, feel free to type that in the Q&A box. You can introduce yourselves there if you'd like. Let us know who's in the room as you're entering. And uh, we will either answer your questions by text chat. My, my colleagues and I will be behind the scenes doing that. Or we may save your questions for the end and have our, our friends from SU Libraries discuss those after the presentation. So uh, this session is, is scheduled to last for about one hour. So we'll have plenty of time to answer everything that's on your minds. And I'll introduce now my colleague, Abby, from SU Libraries, so she can take it from here. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Abby kazowitz Shear. I'm a librarian at the SU Libraries, and I am here with my colleague, Kelly Delavan. And we are going to um, show you a presentation about the library and have lots of time for questions, um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and then Kelly is going to get started. Thanks, Abby. Um, as soon as your slides come up, so um, yeah, I'm glad you're gonna share it. I'm gonna be going through half of our presentation and then I'll hand it over to Abby, but um, as soon as she gets it up here and in, looks like, there we go. All right, so hi everybody. Um, my name is Kelly Delavan, and um, I'll give you a little bit of information about myself. My title at the library is Information Literacy Librarian, which is um, it's a mouthful, <laughs> but basically it means that I am um, really interested in thinking about how students, how faculty, and how our staff here at Syracuse University can use our resources and how they can actually um, learn the skills, the really important skills that you need in order to um, uh, access library resources and how to actually incorporate them into your research. Um, and this is called information literacy. It's a term that librarians like to talk about. If you, um, you may have heard it from a librarian in your high school, um, uh, but it's just something that I'm really interested in and we do a lot of teaching in the library. So um, if when you come to Syracuse University Libraries, um, you have the opportunity to um, come to classes in the library. We will teach you how to use our resources and kind of how to work with very specialized databases that we have because in this day and age with everything information being so digital and just all so much of it right it really takes some guidance. It takes some help from professionals like librarians to kind of get you up to speed with how to do that kind of work. And so that's something that we do a lot of. And I um, work with librarians to deliver that kind of instruction. Abby does a lot of teaching and she'll talk about what she does as well. But um, for now, let's just go ahead and we're going to talk to you a little bit about what the libraries can offer you. So Abby, would you mind advancing the slide? Thanks. So I thought I'd start out with some really interesting facts about the libraries because um, every time I look at these numbers, I'm always kind of blown away. Um, if you think about um, the items that we have in our library, we have 4.9 million of them. And that includes books, eBooks, journals, and video. And um, a lot of it is digital, but if you um, come to our libraries, you'll see that we do have millions of items that are physical and on our shelves. And so it's kind of um, exciting to be at a huge research university because our libraries reflect that and we have a very huge collection. We're also incredibly busy as a library. We get almost 1 million visits a year. So the libraries um, are constantly filled with students and faculty and staff and our um, Syracuse community comes and uses our library as well. Um, and it is, it's the busiest academic building on campus. Students um, really enjoy coming to our libraries and it's fun to be there during classes and you can see um, the tables filled with students doing work on their projects. Um, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, the academic social center for campus. It's kind of the place everybody goes when they know they need to get some work done and the way that students work today, they tend to work with their, with groups, with their friends or with their roommates and so we have a lot of spaces set up for that and I'll talk to you about that in a second. Next slide, Abby. Great. 
So we just kind of wanted to give you a really brief introduction into the ways that the library supports students. And um, by all means, feel free to pop your questions in the chat and I'm hoping that we'll have a good discussion about this, but I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some of the three major things. This is what we wanted to focus on. And this is that how do the library support you? And we do it this through these three ways, with spaces, and that can be, um, I'm gonna talk about that in a second, like the different library branches that we have on campus and the ways that our libraries are designed to support students. Um, we have a very wide range of services and resources as well that Abby is going to be talking to you about. So Abby, next slide. Let's talk about those spaces. Okay, so what you're looking at here is actually the same thing I have in my background. Um, I have a picture of Bird Library at night, but what you're looking at is our largest um, library on campus. It's the library that has the resources for humanities, social, social sciences, um, a lot of our AV resources, our government publications and maps are in this library. There are seven floors to the library. Um, one thing I always like to talk about when I introduce students to the library is the architecture. It's really kind of a striking um, architectural form. And it's actually a very good example of an arch architectural style called brutalism. The library was built um, in the 1960s and I think it opened, I wanna say 1972, don't quote me on that. But anyway, so what's in our libraries is um, the learning common spaces, which Abby's gonna talk about more. Um, and it's a place where, like I was saying, it's, it's very open and we have lots of computers, we have lots of group study rooms, we have lots of places where you can go and kind of do the work that um, fits your style. We have quiet study spaces spaces where it's pretty loud, you know, it just is a wide range. And we also have the Special Collections Research Center, which is at the top floor of the library, and that's where our archives and our rare books and our, just our collections of really interesting artifacts reside. And we have really great exhibitions. So if you come to Syracuse, you can go up to the sixth floor and take a look at whatever exhibits we have on display. It's really a fun place. And then also we have Pages, which is our library cafe. So Libraries, um, academic libraries at Syracuse, you can eat in our library. And um, the cafe is actually the busiest cafe on campus, of course. And um, so that's Bird Library. And next slide, Abby. Okay. So this library is a beautiful building. This library is the Carnegie Library. And it is the library for the sciences, biology, chemistry, engineering, computer science, all those other sciences that are listed on this slide. This is where um, the librarians who support those um, subject areas, this is where their offices are. And it also has a very beautiful quiet study area that is just gorgeous. And um, it's a place that students really like to come to if there's somebody, if they're a kind of student who really likes peace and quiet when they do their studying. And it's really wonderful. Next slide. And this one is the King and King Architecture Library. So this is located, this is actually a picture of Slocum Hall, which is where the department, the School of Architecture is housed. And on the third floor of this building, we have the King plus King Architecture Library. And this um, serves the needs of the School of Architecture, the faculty and its students. We have a librarian for architecture who works over there. And this is kind of where you go to pick up your reserves and your periodicals and reference works that you would use at the King plus King Architecture Library. And it's also, um, we launched, we opened it, we, we redesigned it, and I think it was about a year or two years ago, and it was, it's a really beautiful space, so I would encourage you to check that place out as well. And so within all these libraries that we have, these are the, the three main buildings that house our collections, um, but within all of these places, like I was saying, we have specially designed our spaces to incorporate the ways that students study. And so Abby, if you want to show me that next slide. These are, this is just a variety of the kinds of spaces that we have in the library. We have individual study rooms. We have group meeting rooms that are wired so you can project your laptop and kind of do a group project in, the, in, the, in those spaces. Um, these study spaces are bookable online, so that's really great. So students can go onto our website and kind of reserve a time and make sure that that space is available for them. Um, remember how I was saying that Carnegie Library has a beautiful study space? If you look at the image on the lower left-hand corner, that is a picture of the um, 
Carnegie Library. And it's just a very iconic library space. You know, it's kind of what you think about when you think about studying in, you know, a big research university library. It's wonderful. The image above is a picture of our quiet study area in Bird Library where you can open the doors, you can go in and that's your silent space. On the other side of those windows is collaborative learning where students are sitting together like it's like a cafe and you're just in there working and um, it's busy and vibrant and a fun place to be. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Abby who's going to finish out the rest of our presentation and then we'll be able to open it up for questions. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so as Kelly mentioned, um, there is what we call a learning commons in um, Bird Library. And that is the lower level first floor and second floor where we have a large number of services that we provide. We have study spaces, it's usually very busy. Um, and I'll just go over some of the, the some of the services that we offer both in the building and virtually. Um, so first of all, I want to talk about the research help that we offer at the libraries. Um, one thing that I just want everyone to remember um, is that library staff are ready, willing, um, they're excited to help students and faculty and staff with any questions that they have about the libraries and about research process, resources. Um, any, any questions that they have, um, we are happy to help. So um, there are a variety of ways that we offer help. Um, we have a very active chat service. Uh, we have, which you can access either from the website or from your phone. You can text the chat service and we will respond right away. Um, we are available by phone and we are also available by email. And in a minute, I'll talk about our in-person um, reference services as well. Um, one thing I'll say about our chat service is it is available 24-7. Um, our Syracuse University library staff are only available you know, during regular hours from about 8 a.m. to midnight, but then after those hours, we partner with other libraries around the U.S. and the U.K. to answer our questions around the clock. So anytime students have questions, we can, we can help them. Um, so I'm going to also talk about our in-person reference services as well. Um, this year, this is what it looks like. Um, everyone in the library is wearing masks. We have plexiglass in our service desks. Um, and we are trying to keep our in-person interactions um, a little bit shorter and saving the longer ones for our virtual services, but again, we are happy to help. Staff is there um, and students and others can ask us questions on anything, as I said, anything ranging from how do you print in the library to can you help me find this particular article to I'm doing a research project on this topic. Can you help me come up with search terms? Um, we even help with things like citing sources when um, students are writing their papers. So we are happy to help anytime. In addition to our service desks in Bird Library, we also have service desks in um, Carnegie and King and King. So um, that is our research in person. Um, we also offer printing and technology help. Um, in Bird Library on the first floor, we have a technology desk um, with staff who are happy to help. Um, in our libraries, you can print from either one of our computers in the buildings or your own laptop. Um, we also loan out laptops, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, students can print in black and white or color in various sizes, anywhere from your typical eight and a half by 11 to um, poster size um, uh, documents. As you can see in this middle picture here, that's one of our plotters where students can print um, large scale documents, either posters or architectural um, drawings and things like that. Um, students can print, um, it does cost 
money, but the, the funds are deducted from a print quota, which is um, given to all students. Um, I believe it's $40 that all students get at the beginning of the year. And then as you're printing either in the libraries or in a computer lab, um, the, the funds get deducted from that print quota and you can always add money to it. And as I mentioned, we do have a technology desk with staff to help. So I mentioned that we have technology for loan. Um, this list here is actually a, a shorter list than what we normally offer um, for the semester, but we do offer laptops, both PCs and Macs are available, um, calculators, headphones, um, multi-port adapters. We have whiteboard marker packs that students can use on our whiteboards in the building and external DVD and Blu-ray drives. Um, all of these um, items are sanitized when they come back to us. Um, and they are, most of our loaned items are available for three hours at a time. We do have a longer laptop loan program that is for um, two weeks and that does cost money, but the rest of the items are available. We'll just um, check them out with your ID, just like you would check out a book or another item from the library. Okay. Um, so moving on to finding resources in the library, we have many, many uh, different kinds of resources that are available. Our website is really the gateway to all kinds of resources that you might need for your research. Um, on our homepage, we have a tool called Summon. It is like a search engine. It says it searches almost everything. It searches um, most of the collection, well, all the collections in the library, as well as some other articles and, and, and items that are available from subscription sources. So, we usually recommend that students start with Summon. Um, it's a good way to find out what's available on your topic. Um, and we also have links to other um, resources on our website, such as our databases, which I'll talk about more in a minute, um, our list of journals, both e-journals and print journals, um, research guides also, which I will talk about. So, um, when students come to Syracuse University, we try to direct them to our website um, as the place to search for um, information for your research. And um, another thing that I will mention is students can access our resources from on campus, obviously, but also from off campus. All they would have to do is um, type in their Net ID, which is an, an, an ID that students would get to connect to the campus network. Um, and then they could access all of our resources from anywhere. So just to give you an idea of the types of resources that we have access to, in addition to our books and um, DVDs and maps and government documents and all the things that are in our library collection, um, we subscribe to a large number of databases, as you can see, um, over 700 um, databases that are collections of articles, images, videos, um, maps, data, all kinds of things. Um, you may be familiar with some databases from your high schools or your public libraries or other institutions. Um, we do have a very large number of um, databases and our subscriptions. Um, some are some will connect you to articles, um, including ProQuest and EBSCOhost. Um, we have Canopy, which links to streaming a video. Um, art Store has images of art pieces. Um, Digital Sanborn Maps obviously would have maps um, and Simply Analytics. Um, links to, to um, some statistics. So this is just a small um, collection of what, what we have overall 
um, but just wanted to give you an idea of the types of databases that we have. Uh, research guides are very important, very helpful resources that um, our subject librarians have put together. Um, we have subject librarians who specialize in um, each of the um, subject areas taught on campus. So whatever your major is or your, your research area, there is a subject librarian who's available to help you and they are happy to you know, email with you or set up a consultation. Um, and they've also put together these really helpful research guides that kind of digest the large um, number of resources that we have and put them in a context that's helpful for research in a particular topic area. So I have a couple examples of screenshots. Um, we do have one on art resources, for instance, and this will link you to um, information that's important in researching art. Um, it also links to things like professional organizations in art, um, museums, um, information about writing about art in other libraries. So that's just one example. Another good example is our business information guide. Um, and this I, I actually use a lot as a staff person um, because you know, if somebody has a question about business and I'm not necessarily an expert in that area, um, I come to this guide to find out things like, okay, how, what are the best databases for company research, for market research, for industry research, things like that. So I always like to promote the research guides. And finally, I just wanted to talk about um, some events that the library hosts. Um, you know, in a typical year, we do have a large number of in-person events, and these are just some examples. Um, our Welcome Fest is kind of an orientation event that we have at the beginning of the semester. Um, we have um, tables out on the first floor of Bird Library, and we talk about library resources and services, and we also invite other um, organizations to come in and talk about what they have to offer, like public libraries um, in the area. And it's a really fun event. We usually have food and raffles and prizes and, and all kinds of things. And Otto, the orange, shows up sometimes. Um, another event that I'm really excited about that we've offered for several years in person and hopefully we'll do remotely um, this year is the Living Library. Um, and that is an opportunity for people in our campus community to come together and learn about each other's life experiences and their backgrounds. Um, we have living books who are actually you know, people, um, students, faculty, and staff who um, have one-on-one -on -one or small group conversations with um, people who are interested. Um, and it's something that we, we like to do. It helps promote diversity um, and break down stereotypes. So it's, it's a really exciting event. Another thing that we have offered is study breaks during finals. Um, as you can see in the picture on the bottom, we have board games, um, crafts, things like that, just to help students um, take a break from studying and get together with their friends. So these are things, like I said, that we've done um, in the past in person. We do have some um, virtual events also coming up. Tomorrow we have something called Orange Quest which is a um, competition that'll be about a week long and students can um, do a series of challenges and, and answer trivia related questions to win some prizes. So we're always um, trying to engage students um, and you know, through our services, as Kelly mentioned, we're always trying to teach students the research process and um, help them you know, with developing their information literacy skills, which we, we do through classes and through our reference services. Um, and we like to also hold these events to engage students with the library in other ways. So we have a few frequently asked questions before we turn it over to the group for, for your questions. Um, so Kelly and I think we'll answer these together. Um, first question is, can I work in the library? Um, Kelly, did you want to take that one? 
Sure. Um, yeah, we um, hire lots of students in our library. We have students working in practically all of our departments, students helping with circulation, where they help you to check out books. Students do a lot of shelving of books. Um, we have students that are floor monitors that are just kind of in the library to make sure that everything is going okay and that nobody need, that if people need help, we can get to them. We also have students that work in the behind the scenes, working in preservation and helping to repair books and students work in special collections. We have them everywhere. One thing that I am really proud of is I run a program called the Information Literacy Scholars um, program. So there are graduate students. So Syracuse University has a library um, you can get you can get a degree to become a librarian at the School of Information at Syracuse. And so I hire students from the School of Information to work with me. And basically, I'm teaching them how to become future librarians. And so they're doing a lot of um, the information literacy instruction that Abby and I have talked about. And so we're kind of working with them together. And so that's a program that I really love. Um, eating in the library. I think I already addressed this one, so I'm just going to go ahead and say, yep, you can, except for this semester because of COVID restrictions. So, of course, this year, you know, things are a little different, but yes, you can. The cafe is really popular, and um, yes, you can eat in the library. We just, you know, expect students, once you're here, you know, you're respectful and clean up after yourself, and things seem to work out okay. Uh, Abby, you want to uh, cover the last three real quick? Sure. Um, so we touched on this a little bit earlier. Do libraries have resources for my major? And the answer is yes, no matter what your major is. Um, I mentioned that we do have subject librarians um, and we have those research guides. Um, one thing that the subject librarians do is they're responsible for making sure we have items in our collection that support the curriculum and the research going on at the university. So no matter what your area of study is, we, we have a librarian and we have resources for you. Um, and the next question, what if the libraries don't have a resource I need? Um, we have a very active interlibrary loan program. Um, students can request that we um, get articles or books from other libraries. Um, and in a lot of cases, we can email a scan of an article to a student um, from another library because of the arrangement we have. Um, so I always tell students, don't worry if the one book or article um, that you want is not available at SU libraries, we can still um, try to get it from one of our partner libraries through interlibrary loan. Um, and it's pretty quick, so, and it's free. <laughs> so I like to point that out. Um, and finally, do the libraries have non-academic collections? Um, we don't have a fiction section of the library per se, but we do have fiction and, you know, current um, nonfiction um, in the library kind of integrated within the collection. So you might just have to search for it or ask a staff member for help. Um, we do have things like board games and puzzles um, that are available at the library. And we also have a new book um, display that we usually have on the first floor of Bird Library that shows both fiction and nonfiction um, that have just been acquired by the library to kind of have it out in front for people to see. So I think that's it for our prepared um, information, but I would like to open it up to your questions. Great, Abby and Kelly, thank you so much. We do have a number of questions in the Q&A box. We can either sort of dispatch those to you, or if you're able to view that, that Q&A box, you can just go through those questions, whatever you prefer. Yeah, I can, I can see them, and I would be happy to um, go ahead and start answering some of the questions. If that's okay, Abby, you can take a little rest. <laughs> um, so the first question I'm seeing is, does the library offer free tutoring services for students? So the library's partner, we have a lot of partners in our library, and actually the picture of Bird Library behind me is home to CLASS, which is the Center for Learning and Academic Student Success. I hope I got that right, but that is the tutoring center, and you do have free tutoring, and it's in the lower level of Bird Library, and you can go down there, and you can do semester-long tutors. Um, you can do drop-in sessions. So that's, yes, you can get free tutoring in the libraries. It's just provided by the CLASS center. 
Um, how long can students borrow books before having to return them? So undergraduate students, and correct me if I'm wrong, Abby, you have a semester loan. So if you check out a book in the fall, you don't have to bring it back until you leave for fall break. It's the same thing as spring. Um, you can also renew books. So it's not like you can only have it for that long. You can definitely continue to renew your books. So yes, that's it's a pretty long time. Usually, um, I think that's usually enough to get what you need done. Is there a limit of how many pages you can print? I don't think there's a limit. It's just if you go over your quota, then you will have to start paying um, out of pocket. You'd have to buy like a printer card or can you just put money in the... You, you can add money to your print quota with a credit card on the um, printing site. Cool, thanks. Um, do you have a 3D printer that students can use? Um, the libraries does not have a 3D printer that I'm aware of, but I know that the Syracuse University has a maker space, which is actually a, just across the street from where Bird is and up the hill a little bit. And there they have 3D printers that you can use. Um, I love all these questions, by the way, this is wonderful. Um, so can students use the special collections for their own research and how does that work? You absolutely can. So the special collections are open for um, students, faculty, staff, the community. Um, you generally need to um, make an appointment and consult with a librarian who, we have a reference librarian up at the Special Collections Center and you might wanna contact them to let them know what your research area is so that you can kind of decide what equipment, I mean equipment, what materials we have that you might want to examine. So you kind of need to know that in advance. It's not a library, it's not a collection where you can walk in and just browse and look at all the neat things that we have. You need to ask them to pull collections for you and then you come into a special reading room where you can work with the materials because they're all very, very, um, some of them are extremely fragile, some are extremely valuable. And so all of this is kind of in a controlled environment, but students are absolutely welcome to use our collections. Um, in your opinion, what's the most unique item in our collection? I'm going to let me and Abby answer this, but I'll tell you what I think is unique about our collection. Um, and it has to do with the special collections is we have um, the plastics collection. We have on the sixth floor of the library, we have a room that is called the Plastics Pioneers Room. And it's one, it's one of the most beautiful spaces in the library and one of the most beautiful spaces on campus because the view is incredible. But in there we have thousands and thousands and thousands of plastic artifacts, um, like hair combs, um, sunglasses, just like in the age of plastic in the 50s and the 40s and all of that, like we have tons of that stuff. And we even have a curator who's the plastics curator. I would say that there's not many libraries. In fact, we're probably the only library that has a plastics curator working up in special collections. Abby, what's your, what, do you have an idea of what you think is the most unique thing? Well, I think, um, I can think of a couple things, again, up in Special Collections Research Center. Um, we were just talking before the um, presentation started about the Oscar um, award that we have um, from the movie Ben-Hur. I think um, the, the person who composed the music got an Oscar. So we have that in our collection. So. Yeah, I, I, I like the Oscar. We did, Abby was talking about the fun events that we do in the libraries. A couple of years ago, we did an escape room and the the escape led you to special collections. When you finally found your way, you got to take a picture with the Oscar, which was really fun. So yeah, that that's a really good, unique item in our libraries. Um, when do the libraries on campus close and does the time change during exams? That's a great question. You can certainly check out our official hours by going to our library's website. Um, generally we're open and Abby, we're, it's 24 hours Sunday through Friday? Friday night. Yeah, it's, yeah, we say 24-5, yeah. so like Sunday morning to Friday night, and then the weekend hours are 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., I believe, but um, yeah, we do try to stay open as much as possible, um, and it used to be that we would open um, longer during finals, but then I think we just started staying open throughout the semester. Yeah, and then um, uh, and I'm sorry if I if you just said this, but finals were just constantly open during finals week. Is that what you just said? I'm sorry, I blanked out there. <laughs> um, the other question, let's see, we have: Do you receive the forty dollars each semester? Is it per year, Abby? I believe it's per academic year. You get it in August. Um, I can. I think that would be on the printing website. 
Uh, but what I, I just saw the other day was that it's, they say at the beginning of each academic year, you get the $40. And Abby, since you're since you tend to work, you're in the learning commons, just generally, do you see students going over that quota a lot, or do you find that that $40 tends to be sufficient for students? I think normally it's it's sufficient, you know, depending on how much printing a student does. But every once in a while, I, I will have to direct a student to the printing website to, to add money to their quota. But uh, I think normally it, it is enough. Great, thanks. Um, the last question I see in here, actually, no, there's more coming. Okay, here's one. Are the contents of the library separated by major or is it the student's job to look for the book they need? That's a good question. So you could, um, the library is organized by a system called the Library of Congress classification system. So if you're coming from a high school, you might be used to the Dewey Decimal System, which is how public libraries and school libraries are tend to, tend to be organized. And that is by subject, you know. Um, so the Library of Congress system is similar. There are subjects. And so like the sciences, you know, all the medicine books tend to be in one area. Like Abby said, the literature books will be in one area. Um, so that's kind of how the, collections are organized. Now your major, however, doesn't necessarily, it's not going to be like um, the biology major section, right? So there is a section for biology books, but whatever you're researching could cross those disciplines, right? So you might be interested in biology, but maybe you're interested in the history of biology. And so that might take you to the history of science, which is shelved in a different area, right? So um, do, uh, is it up to students to figure that out? No, we're not going to, we're not going to, you don't walk into the library and, and it's up to you to just kind of figure things out. That's why we're here. That's what libraries are all about. What I was talking about at the very beginning about how using a library is, it, is it's, it's a, it takes learning, right? You have to learn how to do it. And so you can walk right into our library and say, hey, I need books on X topic and we will help you find them. Okay, so that's definitely um, what we're here for. That was a great question. And then let's see, here's one. Do you ever have authors visit to do book talks? We have lots of events and we have had authors visit to do book talks. I know that um, we're actually, because we're so virtual this year, we're having virtual book talks because the Syracuse University Libraries also has the Syracuse University Press. So we have our own university press and we publish a lot of books, um, academic books, um, some uh, popular books, and so we tend to have um, the authors of those books come to our library and give presentations or book talks. But then also the library is home to, and again, Bird Library, we have a big room called the Peter Graham Scholarly Commons. And that is where we have lots of academic events where you know scholars from all over the world come to the library to talk to us about their research. And usually sometimes if they've re released a new book, they may come and read from the book. And we also have, um, gosh, we even have a poetry reading series. So we have poets coming in and uh, reading in the library. So yes, that's what we have in the library. Let's see, looking at another question. I love that you guys are asking so many questions. This makes me so happy. Um, when students work in the library, are they paid or is it similar to volunteering? Oh, Michelina, you asked a great question. We pay our students when they work in the library. Um, you can have, we have a, a variety of, um, I know that there are work study jobs. So if you're an undergraduate, you may qualify for work study, which is a form of financial aid. And so you can get a job and be paid through that. And then we also do hire, because we hire so many students, we have students who are not work study and we just hire them and pay them hourly and they get paid um, an hourly rate um, that is um, designated by the university. So, oh, you limit of how many pages you can print. Sorry, you missed. Um, no, there's no limit. No limit on how many pages. It's just if you go over your quota, you might have to pay extra. Wow, we did it. We just, we just cleared the question and answer um, board. So if there's any other questions, um, how would we want to go about that, Lisa? <laughs> yeah, I think there was one question earlier, which you touched on, but we may, there may be more to share. A student asked about sort of COVID restrictions and how that may have impacted the use of the library this semester. So I know you touched on that a little bit, but if there are any other policies or anything different this year, that might be good to share. Abby, did you want to take this one since sure. it, it, it's, you've been 
involved in it a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, in addition to the plexiglass and everyone wearing masks, obviously, which which you have to do on campus anyway, um, we do have um, like our study rooms. Normally, we have group study rooms where you could go, you could reserve a room with a group of friends or classmates and and work together. We're not allowing that this semester. It's only one person in a room at a time. Um, another thing that we have started this semester is um, in addition to being able to come into the library and, and pick up a book off the shelf yourself, you can also reserve a library in advance and a staff person will go pull it for you and um, hold it at the desk for you so you don't have to spend as much time in the library. Um, so there are things like that. We're taking it very seriously. Um, in fact, many of our staff members are still working from home. We have a, a limited number of staff members in the building at a given time. Um, we don't, we usually, we used to have um, librarians and staff work one hour shifts at each service point and then rotate. And now we have one person in a spot for four hours at a time. Um, so there's not as much mixing up. There, there are other things too. There's a lot of sanitizing. Um, we have a little drawer that we put items in and there's um, I think ultraviolet light that um, uh, we, we use on the, on the materials. So yeah, those are just some examples, but it's, it's definitely changed a lot in the way that we work and the way that um, the campus community interacts with the library, but we're still doing a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, one thing that I didn't mention is um, our chat service, um, the activity has increased a lot um, starting last spring and this fall. Um, so, you know, may, we have this 24 seven service and that's being used a lot more than it has in the past. We have fewer in-person interactions and a lot more virtual. Well, great. I think we've responded to all the questions. So I wanna thank, thank both of you, Kelly and Abby, my colleagues from admissions behind the scenes. We've been answering questions as we go. Uh, but thanks to both of you for sharing some of the amazing things that are happening at the SC library system. We hope that for the attendees, for students and parents who joined us tonight, that this was a helpful session for you. We will, we're recording it, so we will make that available on YouTube. It may take a couple days to post there. So if you had to come in or out or, or missed something, you know, we'll, we'll have that online for you in just a couple of days. So, so thanks again to everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at a future virtual session. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.